Appreciate all your concern, appreciate all your prayers and good thoughts. But uh, the journey continues and uh, let's make the most of it, everybody. Bye now. Met him at the vineyard. No reason to meet him except we just bumped into each other. And he was part of our home group. And uh, that we were all, uh, <clears throat> all to be uh, uh, part of. And, um, and it was kind of random. You know, that he snuck into her life. I honestly don't remember us as little kids. I've seen the pictures, but I don't recall a strong, young, young uh, memory. But I do recall when we went strawberry picking with my mom and my aunt and my cousin. And that was one of the early memories uh, that I have of him. Uh, basically, we were out strawberry picking because we wanted to go on a holiday and my mom and my aunt were definitely gung-ho making money for this trip and uh, we were supposed to be helping pick strawberries and my cousin Danny and my brother Paul decided that they would rather wait for beans and so they stopped picking. It was kind of a fun memory that we all have of, of Paul and Danny at the time. So, today I'm going to talk about why you've been important to me in my life and why friends are important. We all know how important friends can be, how important friends are, and depending on the relationship, some friends are more important than others. And I would say that you were certainly in the running for the top one anyways. Thank you, Paul. You've been really a tremendous and valuable, wonderful friend to me going ahead of me in so many things in your life, just being there. So I appreciate that. I think he, in the last couple of years there, he's uh, really made an effort and, uh, and tried to involve us into his life more. I mean, he was still uh, a very private person and, and the word is compartmentalized. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he was a very private person and uh, he uh, didn't let us in out everything, okay? I mean, there were certain things that he would tell me in confidence and that, and, and, and they would just stay with me as, as brothers, right? Is mourning the loss of a son different than mourning the loss of a husband? Yes, definitely is. His dad and I had a, a long, and a good life. Um, I think of him often, even today. But your son, I mean, he's not supposed to go before me. But that's the way it happened. And uh, if I could change it, I would have, but I couldn't. And that's hard, very hard. Well, I met Paul for the first time when I was about, well, a young teenager anyways, and a bit immature. I met Paul for the first time when he was with my brother, my older brother and my older sister at CBI, um, studying, I'm not sure whether it's a diploma or a degree program, but anyways. Um, my sister was roommates with Krista, and that's how Paul and her got introduced. And um, at the time, I did not have a lot of respect for Christianity because I didn't really understand the depth of what it meant to truly be committed to loving somebody else. Paul demonstrated that to me time and time again. And the very first time that I interacted with him, he explained that it was about being unjudgmental and loving to because that's the way it was. It was just, you just accepted people for who they were and you loved them where they were. And Paul demonstrated that to me in spite of my severely testing his mettle, I can assure you. Um, I was in fact openly antagonistic to what he believed just to see what he was made of. And at the time he was very loving and kind to me in response and always was, no matter what. I think Paul was pretty equitable with his treatment of between Brian and I. I don't think he had a favorite, but then 
you know, we're two different genders, so um, Brian was his favorite brother and I kept telling him I, I was his favorite sister, so um, no, I don't think he had an actual favorite. Um, pretty much I think we were treated pre pretty equally. He wanted to always imprint on me that, um, well, how am I supposed to, how am I explain this, um, that uh, to look at people differently, um, don't always judge them because you don't know what's going on in their life. So, um, and I'm working on that still to this day, but he helped me understand that some people are, are just, you don't know what's going on with them. So, you know, you don't judge them and be kind, you know? Oh, that. Uh, Paul actually decided that he would be my friend. And uh, <clears throat> we were in home group and, uh, and so the prayer and the singing and the, and the sharing and, and whatnot. And he just simply decided that, uh, that uh, he would be my friend. And, and so he just kind of bullied his way in there and say, hey, can I come over? Uh, you know, I have a few, I have a little, uh, a few minutes. Can I, can I drop down? And yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be thinking, oh, I don't really have time, but, but I'm with the kids. Uh, but he would come down anyway, and then he'd come for supper sometimes. And then uh, but he was a handy guy when we moved. <clears throat> Say, who's available? And Paul would volunteer, and he moved us several times, and uh, 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 commented uh, even now when he was wheelchair. Yeah, you know when we when we moved again, he said, "I am not moving you this time." That's for sure. Yeah. Well, my very my very favorite memory is one uh, he loved Christmas, and uh, for two years, and I didn't realize it. He changed the clocks. We we have told him. You know, wait until at least around seven, and he would change them like they were later. And we didn't realize that until later. <laughs> Paul, as a best friend, was always aware of how I was feeling and what I needed. He never lacked for an understanding because he went in front of me. And he would never tire of thinking about what was going on in my life so that he could be there for me when I needed him. And he'd phone me and say, you know, I was thinking about you today and I think you're gonna be going through this soon. And you know, you wanna be aware of this and this. And he was always right. And you know, I didn't always agree with him until I was in it. And then he, I understand. Um, he was always just there for me, regardless of how he took his advice or didn't take his advice. And a good friend knows how to help you fix a problem, or when to encourage you to just drop it or leave it alone because it's a little too crazy. Not that I always listened, but he was always there to tell me. So, a best friend also keeps an eye out for you and helps you when you're out or when you're down. And um, goes before you, goes beside you, walks behind you, um, is just around and solidly around. And I don't mean that as a pun, he was just solidly around. No matter what you were struggling with, Paul was there and he was always willing to provide advice even if you didn't want it. Um, in high school, uh, because we were in high school together, he was two years ahead of me. So when I came to high school in grade eight, he was in grade ten. Um, he he was pretty well established, and he was um, part of the, I guess the, if you want to classify, part of the nerd group, uh, because he was into the sound aspect, the audio visuals. Um, he was into basketball, so he was working with the basketball team. Um, I think he was pretty popular in his own realm of, of 
uh, friends and uh, groupings as we have in high school. Um, so yeah, I think he, he had a good group of friends and he was quite well known in, in high school. I quite often got, oh, you're Paul Dondo's sister. It was never Brenda as my own. I was always Paul Dondo's sister, so uh, that kind of says it all in, in terms of how popular he was in school. Safe to say that uh, mortality kind of, he let his guard down a little more and was uh, uh, more willing to be close with you guys in a way that maybe wasn't as on the same level. Yeah, um, yeah, he did let his guard down a lot, like quite a lot, um, and, and let us in, as uh, Brendan said er er earlier in his inner circle. Okay, so because we were always um, kept uh, at arm's length of, uh, from what he was going through and, and the stuff that he was dealing with through the day to day life, right? Um, so you didn't know what kind of life he was leading because he didn't, he wouldn't tell you. you know, so, yeah. So let's say roughly since. 1990. Did Paul talk about his two sons with any regularity or frequency? And is there anything you'd feel comfortable sharing, like any general comments if he did say something that maybe mm -hmm. would be important for his sons to hear retrospectively? From when first know Paul, uh, his uh, first the uh, uh, the pain of his. Uh, 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 of his uh, uh, marriage uh, breakdown, and then uh, the uh, uh, the continuous uh, difficulty in getting to see his sons. He spent so much time, effort, and uh, uh, went over the uh, went over with uh, with us the uh, the pain and difficulty of trying to get a whole uh, getting to see his sons. Uh, and when they moved to Ontario, uh, he was uh, he would be desperate to uh, to see them and and would describe to us the the difficulty that it uh, uh, that it entailed to to set anything up to see them. Uh, uh, it was a topic that happened every single time we met him. You know to how that uh, he had wanted to get to see Josh and Joel and. And that uh, the plans didn't work, and that they were being difficult, and that he was having to uh, uh, do so many extra things to, to try to make it work, and the frustration of things not working, even when he tried, and uh, uh, and through all this, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the budget associated with uh, with travel, uh, you know, was. Uh, uh, it was really difficult for him. Uh, he, uh, 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 he was able to support himself certainly, but uh, but extensive trips were uh, uh, were a large burden for him. And uh, he would share with us how much he he anguished over not seeing his sons and that they were growing up without him. Uh, that uh, that was a theme that was every time and all the time. He'd be with our kids and then, and reflect on how, uh, and uh, is our, our kids and us, and together, and uh, uh, it would remind him of how he wasn't with his boys and that the same experience couldn't happen with them. Uh, and, uh, and it was a huge pain for him. Where he was able to reconnect, uh, did he? have any observations or kind of uh, a uh, reconsideration of being a dad and a father in light of reconnecting with him? Oh, oh when uh, he was able to connect again, uh, uh, he, uh, it was all he would talk about. He would talk about Josh this and Joel that and and this is how well they're doing, and the, this is the great things that are happening in in Josh's life and in Joel's life, and and they were just the 
best things since sliced bread and I knew that my kids were the best but uh, he would insist that uh, uh, that his kids were, were doing just the most awesome things uh, and they and they were and uh, they uh, uh, they're both extremely talented and he had much to crow about and he crowed about it all the time the thing about Paul was that he always would how is his ideal relationships? Relationships were seemed to be the way that he measured his value with each other. Like his value with you was measured by the relationship that he had with you and the depth of the relationship that he had with you. And he took a great deal of personal responsibility in making sure that everybody he came in contact with that he cared about and that was pretty much everybody knew that they were loved and accepted even though he held out a standard that encouraged you to do better it was always done in, in my opinion in a loving way and I asked him throughout this cancer trip whether or not it had affected his faith at all and because it can be difficult. I mean, you're facing the end of your life and you're thinking about questions. Um, you know, you don't really have time to get it right or reflect on it or um, decide to switch faith if you want to, if you know, you feel like your faith has let you down or if you feel like, you know, God has given you a raw deal. So Paul told me on numerous occasions that if anything, this whole process had strengthened his faith and he was looking forward to um, being on the other side and being at peace. Um, life had been somewhat difficult for Paul and I think he was looking forward to having that part of his journey be over. So, you know, from my point of view, um, his faith never wavered and whether or not he was involved in a community, church community or not, locally, I don't know. Um, we didn't go to church together much after probably after the first 20 years of our relationship um, we seemed to go in different directions of course he was living in a different community than I was and um, he liked a different style of church relationship than I did so um, but he never wavered in his faith and his commitment and I would like to believe that that is now where he is. That he is in heaven with God and um, he's enjoying, you know, what's interesting is that I have felt um, very close to Paul after he's gone. I felt when he left, I felt his presence close. I'm wearing one of his old shirts today, which thankfully Karen brought to me. Um, and I wear it with pride. I wear it with a sense of appreciation. I feel, I feel almost a bit wise in the shirt, um, even though the shirt really doesn't literally make any difference to my ability to think or provide professional services. But it feels that way. It feels like I've been able to carry a part of him with me into the into the present days as I go through my days and. Death is hard. It's it's a hard thing, and um, it's hard not to want to end your own life when somebody you love dies because the pain is so great and it's so overwhelming. However, you can comfort yourself by allowing His presence um, to be there with you, and that's how I have sort of often asked myself, you know, even out loud, you no, know, what do you think, Paul? And uh, Paul may have left the building, but he's not left our hearts. He told me a story about a, a chair he had, and uh, he kept dragging this chair around, and nobody could figure out why. So he had it redone, and uh, he said that uh, somebody he knew when, when they close their door, that would be uh, IWA Union boardroom. That's where they came from. Uh, this woman 
friend of his uh, had two. She gave one to uh, Paul, and then he had it redone. And uh, and since uh, his dad worked at that plant as well, um, I asked him. I says, "Well, he wanted me to pick out something I wanted of his." And I picked the chair, and I, I have it in my house now, and I'm so happy about it. Every time I sit in it, I think of him. <laughs> <laughs>